We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is within the ancestral territory of the Suquab people of clear salt water, Suquamish people. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquabs lived in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquabs live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliot Treaty of 1855. So welcome everyone, thank you so much. I'm sorry that um, Noelle has been unavoidably detained by a very unfortunate incident with her, uh, one of her kids at school, um, but she says she will join us as soon as she's able to. And I feel that that's more important for her to deal with her son's, um, protecting her son than it is to talk to us, but she did say she would join us as soon as she can. Um, in the meantime, I've been thinking a lot uh, lately about losing a language, about living where your language, your home language, your ancestral language is forbidden or simply unknown, and how grounding and rooting our home language, our childhood language can be. Uh, and I'd love to have thoughts of if any of you, who, if you've thought about this before yourselves, um, I think so many of the Native American people have had a lot of language loss because of the mission schools where they were forbidden to use or speak their languages. Um, and that <clears throat> really, at one point, some of the only recorded language, uh, language examples we had were Edward Curtis's that were made at the time that he was doing photographing a lot of the tribal people across America. Um, and those preserved language tapes or whatever they were. They were like wax cylinders, I think, in those days. Um, but that was really the kernel of some of the restoration of lost languages uh, for a number of tribes. Um, it's not uh, my personal language, but I about five or six years ago, I went um, to a Navajo reservation and did some a service thing. And um, the woman who and the um, structure that had been the uh, school for the children when they were taken from their families was still on the prim on the campus there. Um, and the woman who was guiding us around was one of the women who had who's, who had been taken from her family. And she was now, in her early 50s, I'd say, and had come back to reintroduce her language to the Navajo children. And so she, that was her, that was her, her goal, she, that was her role in the, um, on the campus. And it was um, very powerful to, to realize that she had been able to make that circle and, and to come back. So it's, it's, happening. It, it is happening elsewhere anyway. Yeah, I don't know if, if some of you had been listening to some of Barbara Lawrence's wonderful programs for us, but in one of them, she talks about how <clears throat> listening to her granddaughter, uh, who was chosen to be um, the princess in Chief Seattle days some years ago, and her granddaughter gave her acceptance speech in Lushutsi, and Barbara was saying how she just ended up with tears in her eyes, and what a strong powerful moment that was that another rising generation has this language and is bringing it to life and keeping it alive. Um, yeah, to me, that is so beautiful. I'll say a few things. Um, having worked uh, closely with Gina Corpus as she was researching and then uh, starting on the Honor Thy Mother pro project, um, there was more than just suppression of the Native American language. It was the suppression of the whole Native American culture having been raised in the Pino uh, here on Bainbridge Island. And um, and if, if those of you who, maybe someone mentioned this and I wasn't paying attention, those of you who have seen that um, documentary will recall the part, I think where it's Anna who's talking about, and Gina too, talking about their mothers um, using some different language in the outhouse um, but not inside, and they thought they called it the outhouse language, but they knew their mothers were really, really happy when they were using that language. And so um, anyway, for the Indipinos on Bainbridge, the discovery of the uh, 
Squamish language. I'm not, it's probably a brand, um, some variation of Lushootsi. There are all sorts of Salish dar dialects around the sound. And, um, but it has been a um, discovery, just like I'm sure Noel has mentioned too, of a culture, the language so much part of the culture and how that is a key to bringing back the culture and honoring and celebrating it. So, and I also know this is neat that, um, and Kimmy knows this too, the Suquamish tribe uh, is requiring some different groups on the island and elsewhere who want uh, some information or feedback from the tribe or some input from the tribe for to designate a person from the organization to study, to take the shoot seat as, um, you know, um, a sort of a trade-off there. So they're increasing the uh, literacy and understanding and appreciation of that language. So. Oh, thanks, Robin. I remember when I was a student in Italy learning a, another language and an immersion technique, I felt so lucky to be able to be immersed and how much harder it is to learn when you can't or when it's really difficult to find a number of native speakers. Um, but I also remember being taught that a language is a map to the culture it belongs to. And without that map, uh, it can be very difficult to reclaim the culture as well. Um, in, in working with a, uh, the tribe in the city of Palsbo and Bloedel uh, in trying to translate different things, um, some of the, the people from the um, non-native organizations are been having a rough time understanding the concept that there is no direct translation, not only between a Lushootsi word and an English word, but they're not even concepts. We, you know, there are certain concepts in English that aren't even in the Lushootsi language. And so having the, the translators are having to come up with sort of an equivalent. And um, and we've been running into, uh, I wouldn't say snags, but there's a, um, I think there's a cultural gap until people begin to understand what you were alluding to, Anne. The, 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 you can't have a direct translation. Let the Lushootsi concept the closest to it come through and then that gets translated back into English and it may be very different from the English that the organization started out with. Yeah. So, and think of the misunderstandings that can arise when you assume that you know what someone's talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go for it, Kristen. I just wanted to say I've been taking Lushut seed th through the tribe for the past several months and the Hatslechel um, Taldagwi, which is uh, greetings everyone. Uh, the first week that I had class, I went and tried that on uh, at the grocery store and the gas station. And um, the interest, it's been interesting to see people, t you know, tilt their heads and wonder about that. But one of the things that I thought was so brilliant about um, the way that this language program is being introduced is that it's in nests. It's not um, the way that Western language uh, education happens where you learn a bunch of nouns, you learn some verbs, you start to string them together, but there's a context, a living context, so that you're actually um, using the words in your daily life. And also the fact that the words are of this place um, that you, the sounds that you hear on the beach, the sounds that you hear animals make, those are how the language has come into being. So there's a very um, kind of what you were saying and uh, uh, that's been a very significant thing for me having grown up here and um, understand. So I see Noelle is here. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. And welcome, Noelle. In your, um, we were just talking a bit about how language shapes a culture and how learning a language introduces you to ideas that may not have an exact translation or may not be really equivalent at all to what, and some of the assumptions we can make if we go in thinking that it's all going to be one-to-one. But welcome to you and <laughs> thank you very much for making time for us. Um, we really appreciate your presence very much. Well, thank you for the invite actually. Um, you know, as I was telling Kimmy and others the other, the other day, it's been a very long time since I've taught language or really been 
immersed in our language program. Um, and also thank you all for your patience. We're dealing with an issue of racism at my son's school and that's been an ongoing theme since North Kitsap School District was established. So um, that, took a, that took a little chunk of our morning. So again, thank you guys for your patience. I mean, this all ties in, you know, language and its power. Like I was literally thinking of that um, when I was trying to explain why words are violent to a child this morning, you know, and how they have so much more power than just the sounds that, that they make, you know. My son was called a racial slur that um, normally doesn't impact Indigenous people, but he's Afro-Indigenous. And so he just gets a whole litany of, you know, opportunities to be marginalized. So um, anyways, I have prepared a PowerPoint so that I can organize all my thoughts. Noel Persitsitsta, Cynthia Persitsitsta, Sitsitskoi, Selakwab Tista, Satibad, Otachad, Sakwab, Sokwab Shed. My name is Noel Purser. I'm the daughter of Robert and Cindy Purser. I'm a member of the Suquamish tribe and I live here in Suquamish territory. However, my family territory, historically, our winter village, or at least our mo most recent winter village, as in, in the last several hundred years, was out in Chico. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Erlins Point, but Erlins Point um, used to house a whole bunch of Suquamish and Duwamish people, and that was my family. Um, at the, at the time of uh, the treaty signing and the establishment of the Port Madison Indian Reservation, my direct line of Suquamish people decided to stay in our traditional village site. And we were able to do that through intermarriage with non-natives. Um, there was an ancestor of mine who was the second husband of my great-grandmother, great-great-great-grandmother, who um, basically claimed all of our family village territory during the Land Claims Act and other things like that, and was able to protect his stepchildren and children from the reservation system by, um, you know, basically putting all that land in his name and then allowing, you know, his in-laws to live there, even though we'd always lived there. Um, so that, I mean, that area encompassed from like where Winko is in Bremerton all the way to um, Erland Point and a little bit beyond. And over the years, as different families uh, married out or sold property off, it just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. So um, <coughs> that's my traditional family territory, though, Erland Point specifically. Chico Creek was always a sacred spot for us. Uh, we called it Spachiel, which means to whistle, which is a spiritual connotation. So um, that's where I'm from, but I live here on the Port Madison Indian Reservation now. So when I was a little girl, um, we didn't really do much with the Suquamish tribe, even though I'm enrolled here. And even though most of my immediate family is enrolled here. Historically, our people didn't really identify so much by, by tribal community as they did by familial connections and caste. Um, the old caste system was abolished with the signing of the treaties. And so a lot of the words that signified a person's caste um, transformed or became obsolete. You know, so historically, my family was of the Siab caste, which is the highest you can get and um, encompassed numerous leaders, most of whom never made it into non-Indigenous records because they only recorded the males, you know, so you only got a handful of them, like, like Chief Seattle or Kitsap or anything, you know, but you never heard about their mothers, their wives, their daughters, their sisters, who were of equal status and of equal influence. So that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> Um, so when I was little, one of the benefits that kept my family able to preserve a lot of what we call squadzadad, ancestral knowledge, was we were not part of the reservation system. Suquamish had the Indian agent, Isaac Stevens, living here, whereas other tribes didn't have to, I mean, they, they were subjected to assimilation efforts. They didn't have the like governor of the state, let alone the man tasked by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was a branch of the War Department back then, living on their reservation. That's how big of a threat Suquamish was 
to the effectiveness of colonization in the region. So um, the feds sent him to live here, like to really keep a close eye on us, because if he could take down Suquamish, then the rest would follow suit. So um, my family, however, got to practice a lot of the stuff that was forbidden in secret because we weren't immediately under his, his eye. And even to get into our, our village site, you know, you would have to go through, like if you're going by water, which even up until about 70 years ago was the easiest way, um, you had to pass what's now the Manette Bridge out there in Bremerton. And there used to be a giant rock. And if you didn't get up on that rock and sing a certain song, you'd be killed. You know, it's like the, it's the password, you know, to get in. And so, um, we, you know, we were hit, we were still hit with a lot of the assimilation efforts, but it was a little more delayed and then a lot more was able to be preserved. So I was raised fully immersed in our ancestral spirituality, which was outlawed until 1979. And even up until um, maybe 15 years ago was com kept completely hush hush. You know, we didn't even talk about it with other Indians because the effectiveness of colonization um, made a lot of indigenous people even afraid of their own ancestral knowledge. It was labeled voodoo, evil, devil worship, things like that. And I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth, but that's just, you know, that's what the boarding schools and um, the colonizers taught our people, or our kids specifically. And in this spiritual community, a lot of the ceremonies and songs are done in our language. And they have to be because of what was mentioned earlier. There's just some things that do not translate, like our word chach, you know. Um, the closest I can come up with is like soul, spirit, or like state of being, your feelings. Like there's a lot of things that encompass chach, but it's like it, it, it doesn't have a perfect translation. And then everything surrounding the concept of chach, chach as chach. That's a word for saying like you're sick, like your your um your heart is sick. And that's that's the best translation I can come up with. But what we say, just to summarize it, is Indian sick, which means you are not living in balance with your ancestral knowledge, your squadad, the things that make us indigenous peoples versus just like all the other humans surrounding us. And in our spiritual philosophies or ancestral philosophies, when you are not living in alignment with that. You're, you become sick on like a spiritual level that also manifests physically in a multitude of ways. So even, uh, even those words were lost to our people, you know. Um, I'd hear my elders in my family say things like, oh, they're chet, chet, or they're Indian sick. But a lot of the reservation Indians, it, it would have been a completely foreign concept. Just that, you know, it would not have, they could not even register that because the only tools they'd had to navigate their spirituality were introduced from Christianity. And so it's like, I mean, it was just a, 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 man, a genocide of such magnitude that it's like, I don't even think in our Renaissance and with all the reclaiming of culture that my people have gone through, those who weren't raised with it from infancy like myself will ever comprehend what was stolen from them. Um, for me, there was never a break. Every generation of my family has known exactly who they are. And a lot of that's tied to the language and a lot of that's tied to our spirituality and a lot of that's tied to our ability to subsist off the land without interference from non-natives. Almost no people in Suquamish that I know can say the same. There was a break one to two generations, and that had a huge impact. And it's going to have an impact going forward. So, I mean, it's, I mean, if people, I, I feel like if my people fully understood just what was robbed from them with their language alone, they would be so much more angry than they are. So um, I'm usually the one that's angry for them <laughs> and like, you know, the, and then trying to put the pieces together. So I prepared this slide. So that's, you know, my little introduction here. Here I have some images I pulled off the internet of the Tulalip Boarding School and um, a Tulalip Longhouse. Because one of the things, like if you ever go to any of our functions that you'll see is our children are everywhere. 
you know, it's uh, in my non-native side, my mom's family, you know, they're, they're non-native, they're from um, Newfoundland. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but, um, you know, they are a mixture of colonists and then more recent immigrants, primarily from Ireland and Scotland and Britain. Um, with them, it was always a little bit different. Children are to be seen and not heard, well-behaved, etc. You know, uh, there was a time and place for children to be present. It, it's it's just a completely cultural different paradigm. Not 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 bad, just different. You know, it, it it all serves its own social purposes. But in my native side, we were just allowed to be, you know, there was times when we were expected to be, you know, sit down, pay attention and be quiet. But for the most part, um, our freedom and our, you know, the, <laughs> the just the freedom to just be and to be wild and explore and, you know, uh, that was celebrated and considered sacred when I was growing up, that was something that my dad's side of the family and their ancestral community prized and protected. And um, one of the things that we're told often is like, you know, our infants, there are teachers, you know, like children are teachers in a way that they, they teach us more about ourselves than we even knew when we were little, you know, we were born so wise and we get dumber as we get older kind of type thing. And then as we get closer to older, you know, to the end of our life, we regained some of that wisdom. And um, anyway, so that was a whole, that's why it was so, uh, I mean, the boarding schools weren't just violent in uh, the physical sense. Every form of abuse happened to our children there, but they were violent in a cultural sense and that children were taught to be ashamed for just existing as they were in their natural state. You know, they they were put in restrictive clothing. You can see here this, you know, this, and, and they were put in gendered clothing. That was one of those things that um, when I was teaching as a teenager, uh, you know, the different like clothes, the names for it, some of my students were like, well, which one's for the boys and which one's for the girls? And I said, well, children weren't really gendered until a certain age, until they started kind of gendering themselves. You know, um, when you're a baby, you're just ZZ, you know, that's, uh, that's, there's, you're not a boy or girl, none of that, that wasn't really relevant. Um, and clothing was more for functionality, practicality to denote status. I mean, if it was gendered in any capacity, it had to do with coming in of age and, um, you know, those sorts of rites of passage. So, and even then that was, purely ceremonial and having to do with like bodily functions more so than, um, you know, this is what you're supposed to wear because you have these genitals. That just was not, not a thing for our ancestors. And so <laughs> there's a story from my Skokomish relatives of um, a man whose parents really did not understand the concept of gendered clothing at all. And he was going to the reservation day school at the time and his parents put him in one of his sister's dresses because he wasn't allowed to go naked, which historically, you know, a lot of our children, they were up until puberty and even beyond. Um, nudity was not considered innately sexual, you know. And so he wasn't allowed to go naked or like, you know, in just a loincloth or anything. And the only European clothes his parents had on hand were his sister's dresses from when they went to school. And so they put him in one of those. And he got beat by the teacher for it. And so, I mean, this the, the, just, just right there, uh, how in English there's so many words to communicate gendered clothing, skirt, dress, and things like that, uh, you know, nylons, it just stuff that we automatically associate with a perceived gender identity. We just didn't have. And so here's our children, you know, in these boarding schools. And even if they never endured a single piece of verbal abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, or physical abuse, they were still being trained to see themselves in a way that was just so outside of the paradigms of, you know, their familial upbringing. And they were taught, you know, um, restrictions, you know, like I doubt this girl would have ever been allowed to wear pants, even if she was doing like hard labor or something. 
these boys' hair was shaved off. You know, and hair is very important to us culturally. So, I mean, the boarding schools are just every level of violent. But one of the things that I realized, I, I mean, the colonization of our minds more so than our bodies. When uh, my grandpa was little, all he spoke was Indian, as he put it. You know, I don't even know if it was Lashutsi necessarily, because his mom was Skokomish. His dad was Sklalem and Suquamish. So I imagine our family dialect was some conglomerate of the three, if not more. But he called it talking Indian or speaking Indian. He and his siblings all spoke it. And when they were at the boarding schools, it was physically beat and burned out of them. You know, when they'd forget English, their tongues would get burned. If, you know, and other things. Yet when I was doing my, um, when I was like learning how to read and write Lashutzi specifically, you know, sometimes I'd practice over at my grandparents' house and something would jog his memory. Like I kept mispronouncing our word for grandpa. I'd say kappa. And one day he said, no, it's tapa, tapa. And it's like, I'd never, no one in our family had ever heard him say that. It was probably the first time in 70 years he'd even said it out loud. Or, you know, so a lot of that kind of stuff happened. Um, more interestingly, when my great aunt had a stroke, she forgot how to speak English. Now, she hadn't spoken Indian since she was maybe six years old when she first went to the boarding schools. And everyone thought she was just speaking gibberish, you know, and I went to visit her because it was the end of her life and she died like a week or two later. And I realized she was asking for water, but she was asking in a way that a very small child might, you know, um, like if, if, you know how in English, like how an adult might say, I'm thirsty, could you please get me a glass of water? But like a five or six year old child might be like, uh, drink please, drink please water. You know what I mean? It might not be concise. And that's how she was asking. And I really, and, but it was in our language. And uh, I'd heard about that, you know, so it was just really like, for me, like, I'm going to cry thinking about it. It's just really, um, it was just really emotional, you know, for me to be able to understand her. Cause that was the first time in all those days after the stroke, when she'd been trying to communicate with people and couldn't that, and it was just because I caught the word quote, which means water. And I was like, she said, she said, quote, she's saying, you know, she's asking for water. And then uh, she said, quack, quack. And she was trying to say quote, quote, but she said, quack, quack, which means like drink, you know? And like, um, I was like, oh my gosh, she's, you know, so then it was just like a game of trying to figure out what she was trying to say. And uh, yeah, so it's what you see here on the right over here, um, inside this long house. These were the places our ancestors lived. And this is what our ceremonial houses still look like to this day. We built them deep in the woods uh, so that the Indian agents wouldn't find them. And so when I was growing up, you know, we wouldn't even be told where we're going because it was still so hush hush and secret because you never know when the winds are gonna change and non-natives are gonna decide it's all illegal again. Because um, in our family, when people got caught, they were hung. And so um, that's just how it was. And then later on, they were arrested or, you know, whatever. And they, people had felonies on their records for praying in our language up until, like, I think the 90s when they finally got them cleared. So, like 1990s, mind you, um, my lifetime. And so, um, you know, we would just be picked up from school a little bit early and I'd know where we were going because the car would be loaded with blankets and snacks and like things because we were going to be staying all night. So we would try to cram as many ceremonies into like one or two nights as possible. And I mean, even in those, in those houses, we're everywhere. The children are everywhere. We're considered a sacred part of the ceremonies. And you see in this picture, there's no children whatsoever present. And um, that's because they're all at boarding school. And so a whole generation of people in most tribes lost all the things that they would have been learning at home. And even the homes themselves were burned eventually because people didn't want us living communally. They wanted us living in nuclear family units. So like I said, um, there's, a, there's a really old house on the Lummi reservation deep in the woods that we would go to. And it's an unmarked road. 
And I mean, it's, I mean, it's super unassuming. You'd never know what's down there unless you knew what's down there. And uh, we weren't even allowed to talk about it, you know, growing up. And like, one of the things I always say about that place is, you know, you're taught to live by the beating of a heart versus the ticking of a clock. And so, um, I mean, all other forms of violence aside, just taking our kids away and not letting them communicate with each other was probably the worst act of violence that we ever endured as people. Um, so here again, you see there's no children. There's a ceremony happening here. And this would have been after the potlatch ban. So this must have been during Chief Seattle days. That was the one day a year that we were allowed to practice our ceremonies. Uh, interesting. Well, I mean, like, unfortunately, we're winter people. Most of our winter or most of our ceremonies are done in the winter. The vast majority of them, actually. So only certain people would have been allowed to um, dress up in their regalia and perform certain ceremonies in the summer. So that right there, you're excluding about 97% of our spirituality by only allowing us one day in the summer to practice everything. And um, it's, <coughs> it's how I, a lot was lost. I also included this picture of a basket weaver, you know, because the way my children and I learned was sitting, you know, when things like this were being done, it wasn't in a classroom setting. It wasn't ever um, like intentional. It was just our great aunts would be working on something and we'd be nearby and we'd be handed the scraps and we'd be allowed to copy what we're seeing. And then, you know, told as we're going along, what's, you know, what's what? Like I see here, like um, chapayats, the cedar roots, and like you just different things like that, that you just learn in the moment. That was also robbed from a lot of people in our community. And one of the reasons the language disappeared. Um, here you see a bunch of, uh, I love this picture. <laughs> I don't know if this is Seattle or Tacoma. But, you know, canoes were the main way that we got around. The last canoe carver until... 2004 and my family was my great grandpa and he passed away before he could teach uh, my grandpa my grandpa was five years old when he died and after that my grandpa went to the boarding schools they finally came for the off-res Indians around that point point. Um, and so anyways uh, there's still somewhere out here because he was carving it on the reservation because they'd burned all of our canoes just a few years before and um on George Lane somewhere, there's an unfinished canoe in the woods covered in moss and things like that. You know, it's been there for about a century now. And that was my great grandpa's canoe that he was carving out here. And um, it just, you know, it's just kind of there now. We'd go find it sometimes when I was a kid. And in 2004, there was finally a new canoe carved in our tribe for the first time in over a century. My cousin got to be a part of that, and um, I'll be showing a picture of that canoe later. But with the disappearance of the canoes, so went about 25% of the context of our language, because, um, you know, we a lot of our spirituality and language is geared around the water and the land, and without the vessels through which to move through the water and, like, perceive the land, you know, the context is gone. <clears throat> On the right here is... Um, Shortly after they burned Old Man House, which was their ancestral longhouse here in Suquamish, it was the only longhouse that was up all year round. Most of us moved around in the seasons. So, I mean, this is just, I mean, you can just see the gradual breakdown of just a couple generations, how our language disappeared. Here you see uh, children present, you know, in um, uh, this would have been a temporary shelter, most likely after the long houses were burned versus here on the right once they've gone through the boarding schools. And so, um, all, like I said, all it really took was one generation in our family for the big break in having fluent speakers to happen of attending boarding schools. 
So when I was a kid, as stated, you know, I grew up in that spiritual community where a lot of um, Lummi and Tawana and other indigenous languages were spoken, Lashutsi or Suquamish dialect, not so much, but um, other ones were, and they're similar enough that when I started learning Lashutsi from Vi Hilbert and Zeke Zalhir, I was able to pick it up real quick because, you know, a lot of the sounds, I mean, there's way, I think there's 42 sounds in Lashutsi and like 26 letters in the English alphabet, if that kind of helps you guys kind of understand how there's, um, so I was used to all those and I could make those. And some of those you'll never actually really be able to hear or make if you didn't hear it growing up is what I was told or for most people. And I've seen that, you know, when I tried to teach my dad, he really struggled um, with some of the sounds. And, he, you know, even at the ancestral spirituality, even he wasn't raised in it as much as I was because for him growing up, it was even more risky. They only attended maybe three or four times a year. Whereas when I was born in 1986, they had been legal for almost a decade. So we got to go almost every weekend all winter long. So it was a, you know, it was a, it was a different experience for me from birth to, you know, adulthood. So, um, <coughs> So when I was 13, I, um, this woman here, Peggy Deem, uh, Quialk is her ancestral name. She was really doing her best to get our people to want to be what we call again, to um, reclaim our culture, to reclaim our history, bring things out of the museums and bring them back to life. You know, and um, she didn't know about the ancestral spiritual disciplines that were still happening. She didn't know there was whole communities where a lot of the stuff that she was trying to, you know, tease back out of the people were still alive and well, if not just kind of hushed. And so she pulled us, <laughs> she pulled us out of the dark because, you know, she would uh, sometimes, in, you know, just not knowing what she was doing, emulate some of the regalia and um, stuff that is associated with that spirituality. And so she'd be told like, no, you, you can't do that. You're, you know, you're wearing something that's for this type of, you, you know, she just really, um, she got folks to finally come out and be more comfortable, like saying, we're here, we've always been here, you know? And then part of that, she had language classes going at the tribal center. And so I would go and um, that's when I started to learn to read and write in shoot Seed. And uh, Peggy, one of the ways that like, she wanted us to not just read and write in it, she wanted us to actively live it. So even though she herself really, really struggled to speak it, I don't think I've ever heard her correctly say a single sentence in La Chute Seed. She made all of us, even if we didn't do it right, get up and introduce ourselves in our language, all of us. You know, we weren't allowed to... Um, sing or dance with her group unless we did this. And she taught us the proper protocol. So even if though she might have struggled with the language herself, she knew the protocols of you start with your mother, then your father, then your maternal grandparents, then your parents. And she would explain to us, you know, why, why this order? And so it's like we were able to kind of piece together. It's like, okay, well, there's some of us who can speak it better than others. And then there's others who understand the context of why we do it. And it's like merging those two bits of knowledge, we were able to reclaim an entire uh, protocol and cultural uh, etiquette. And so now when I go to community events, what was historically something where people would just like cry because they were just so in awe when her group would get up and we would introduce ourselves and people would just be so moved to tears. Now it's just commonplace. Everyone does it. It's just a formality. Boom, on with our lives. And so, um, you know, that's, I mean, that's just one of those things that there's a lot of people who are pessimistic about our ability to bring our language back. But I'm like, well, my grandpa watched it um, disappear and I've been watching it come back, you know, and we lived at the same, we live, you know, we can, you can claim in, in the scheme of our history, we were part of the same era. We might not have been part of the same generation, but we we're part of the same era. So, I mean, for me, I have a lot of hope. I was a teenager at the time. This is me right here. 
And I was the only Suquamish tribal member teaching the language at the time. We had um, us, Willie, who was a descendant from, I think, the Lakota tribes. And we, and he's, uh, he was adopted by a Muckleshoot man and family. And we have by Hilbert, who's, who was Skagit. But um, in my tribe, I was basically it at the time. And I was just doing the introduction stuff just to get my peers comfortable with it. But there were, my vision for what I wanted was so much bigger than what our tribe had the capacity and funds for at the time. And leadership at the time just could not, they, they were part of that generation that was between my grandparents and me. They could not visualize or even comprehend, again, like I said, what was stolen from them. So when I was trying to get different things and programs going, they're like, oh, that's cute. Look at this kid who's excited about things. They didn't take me seriously as someone trying to revitalize their culture if that makes sense. A lot of the things that I wanted to get off the ground, you know, back then, I just did not have the social or political or financial power to do, but others have come along eventually and done it. So it's like, it eventually got done, you know, but it just didn't get done as quickly as could have been, um, which is a whole other, whole other thing with colonization and ageism that was taught through it. Anyways, though, so uh, what I did, what I recognized is like, well, I have me. I have my ability to correctly enunciate all the sounds. One thing I know is that if you introduce children early on to these sounds, it'll be easier for them to make them when they're older. So I made a whole bunch of children's songs and dances that go with them. I uh, would go down to our tribe's early learning center and just do full immersion lunch with the toddlers. You know, and a lot back then we were broke. We didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't have a lot of staff. So the staff was always excited to be like, yes, give me an extra break. Do what you want with the babies, you know? And so, and, and it's so easy, you know, cause toddlers, they're just like kind of, they don't know what the heck's going on around them anyway. You know what I mean? So I would just do full immersion, asking them to pass the milk or, you know, give me the spoon or you just, you know, whatever, and they'll shoot seed. And just so they would hear the sounds and just so that like they would get that exposure, even if I wasn't going to be making speakers yet, I knew that later on when they were older and maybe our tribe was a little more organized and our language program a little more developed, it would be easier for them to learn. So that's where I decided to channel. I was like, well, these adults aren't taking me seriously, but to these babies, I am the adult. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to leverage what power I have, how I can. And um, my friend JR was a huge part of that. I didn't get permission from his family. I just didn't hear back from them or else I would have included a picture of him in here. I'm sure they would have given it, but I just wanted to, you know, as a formality, get that first. So uh, these pictures here I included, this was one of the first times I'd gotten up and introduced myself in our language. And you can kind of see the evolution in, of my regalia here, you know, just that, and the language wasn't just about um, the words themselves. What I found is that people picked it up once, like the context behind it was coming into play too, if that makes sense. So here I'm wearing a ribbon dress. Now these were introduced to us post-colonization, you know, we were given these bolts of cloth and we didn't really know what to do with it. So we would make these, you know, these dresses and these skirts out of it and then decorate it with these ribbons. And uh, here I'm wearing um, a headband <coughs> that actually came off of a berry basket that my great grandma made. You know, my grandpa, I, he, my grandpa put that on me. He took it off the basket. It's not even historically one that we would have worn for fashion or anything like that. But he would have told me that I would have been wearing one of any kind before doing any sort of ceremony, if not that one. And he just wanted me to have the one that his mom made. And so uh, he took it off his berry gathering basket and put it on me. And we all took turns wearing it. And we just had so much pride because it was like, you know, our great grandma's hands touched that. And um, here you see I'm wearing a cedar bark regalia. Now that was something I made just a few years later. And I mean, I'd, I've been gathering cedar bark since I was five and using it in ceremony, for ceremonial purposes, but I'd never really, again, this was one of Peggy's, Peggy's grand schemes. She got us all recreating ancestral clothing from cedar bark to wear um, publicly. And so, 
you know, I, she helped me learn how to make a whole outfit of it. <clears throat> and with that came the language for different forms of weaving, came the language for, you know, again, like um, our words for cape and skirt and things like that, which were basically unisex. You know, before, like I couldn't really explain to people what the word, like, you know, the word for this cape here, it's the best translation I can come up with, meant. But then once we were able to weave them and wear them, now there's context behind that word because I have stated cape is the closest translation, but in our language, when you say the word, you know exactly it means specifically this kind of cedar cape versus this kind. And then over here, I'm wearing a wool blanket uh, with a wool dress. And that's a, that was a whole other, a whole other lesson in weaving for your language for me with us fully about you know, the spinning, the yarn, the dyeing, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, I mean, I mean, just these three examples without them, I wouldn't have had like the context behind the words to like fully absorb them and understand them. Part of my revitalization efforts when I was a teenager, um, I had a whole girl's canoe. You know, I found girls were a lot more open to reclaiming our ancestral knowledge than the boys were. The boys would just be like, oh, you're cute, Noelle, I'll show up because I like you, but I'm not gonna pay attention usually, you know? But the girls in my tribe were like, yeah, Noelle, let's do this. Let's let's make some regalia. Let's go like in the mountains and, you know, let's, let's, let's do the thing. And so I had a whole canoe of girls who um, understood all the commands in our language, you know, for, like left side, right side, you know, starboard, all that kind of stuff. They understood all of those in our language. And uh, we would sing songs in our language and we would create songs. You know, that was one of the things, one of the challenges is um, I would have each, I would try to get each girl to create their own song in our language just so that it would stick better, you know. And uh, you know, that was, that was so much fun. Um, that was a really great, that was a really great group. We did a lot of a lot of great things and stuff now that we wouldn't need a special group for because it's just so commonplace. But when I was a kid, it just, you know, we, we didn't really see canoes that much to begin with and uh, let alone a lot of the stuff that we were doing. And now almost all these, these girls are mothers now and their children like mine have only ever been raised with this knowledge. They never knew a time without it. So, um, you know, like, like I was saying earlier, and like was pointed out, you know, that I heard when I was coming in, that this revitalization isn't linear. It's not sitting down in a classroom, although that was a huge part of it at the beginning too, learning the, you know, ABCs or the ABCs as we call it. Um, <coughs> it's like living, living our culture and then saying, you know, there's words for this. <laughs> and uh, like, so it's like, it's just kind of like, oh, like, you know, mind blowing. Uh, here I put in a picture of my grandpa and I, the day I won Miss Chief Seattle Days. I would um, introduced myself again in our language and spoke about what I was doing in the community for revitalization efforts and whatnot. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I won. And my grandpa was, he didn't really talk much. You know, one of the things I'd always heard from his sisters, he was the baby of the family, is he used to just talk nonstop. He was a little chatterbox and they called it, that's why they called him Sonny. He was a, like, you know, just a little ray of sunshine, a uh, sunny boy. Um, after the boarding schools, he would, I would say maybe in a given day, the most I'd ever hear my grandpa speak was up to a hundred words. And in the course of my life, I don't think I heard him speak more than maybe a few thousand words. Um, he was a very quiet man. The way his trauma manifested was just from, you know, just really kind of shutting down. And so, um, you know, it, that day, though, was the very first. He was also very indigenous in the way, like, Lashutsi really emphasizes action over words. You know, in English, there's like 20 different ways to say the same thing. There's so many synonyms. And Lashutsi, there's not, not as much. Um, it, it, it's, it's mostly, I don't know how to explain it. Like a lot of the emphasis in Lashutsi is in your body language, your tone, 
You know, that's where the nuance lays. That's where you're really communicating what you're saying, you know, and um, there's a lot of phrases that do not exist. Like we don't have a direct translation for I love you, for example. We don't have that because it's demonstrated. We don't have a direct translation for thank you because it's demonstrated. We don't have a direct translation for I hate you because it's demonstrated. And so it's like those kind of things. It's like um, we don't have words for them because they're considered more of actions, if that makes sense. So my grandpa, <laughs> that was like the first day he actually told me I, he loves me. Like, that was the first time in English he ever said it, you know? I mean, he did it in every other way. He showed up to everything, you know? He was part of everything. But that day he told me he loves me. And it was like, really like, oh, <laughs> you know, that was big. Um, and here's my grandpa with my son, you know? And I, uh, I wanted to include that one because my son never mispronounced our word for grandpa. He always grew up calling him Sapa correctly, you know? So, I mean, just that one... Just one generation, you know, where I'm reading, reading our word for what his proper label would have been. That jogging his memory, that mild correction, and then that revitalization. So that, I mean, and that's just one lifetime right there. Might be, you know, three, four generations simultaneously, but we were able to do it just, just in that one little, that's just one little example. Over here, I have more pictures of my son. Um, <coughs> there's a game in our language that um, Zalmai or Espoli created. And it's like kind of an iconic game now. It's like, it's associated with our language and with our people and with our region. It's called the Squirrel Dance. And it's a really simple song. And that's just repeated, right? And it translates to this work is kind of easy. This work is kind of easy, which is so Lashutzi and so indigenous on so many levels because you're literally hop squatting and jumping up and down for the duration of the song until you physically can't anymore and you fall over, right? So the work isn't easy. It's actually not easy, but uh, you're just, it's, you know, you're pretending like it is because that's just, um, it, that's the inside joke, you know? This work is kind of easy. This work is kind of easy. And so when I was a kid, I'd hear people mispronouncing the words all the time to the song. But now, I'll, you know, my kids' generation, they only ever sing it accurately. And they know exactly what it means. Also, like, you know, after the canoes were burned and we didn't have a new one until about 2005, this one over here, the Siama Oaks. <coughs> That, these two were the first canoes brought back to our people after that time. Like I said, my children have never known a time without them. Um, from the time they were born, they were here. And so, you know, here's my son with my third daughter here. And we were visiting one of our village sites in the Seattle area, um, where the sewage plant is now that used to be one of our historical village sites. So we were there for a ceremony and, um, I just really love that picture because it just communicates so much of what has been brought back. You know, my grandpa and his siblings, they were sent to separate boarding schools specifically so that they couldn't communicate, specifically so that they would be isolated and more easily broken. Um, when they were, when my grandpa was accidentally placed at the same school at one point as his sister, they pretended not to know each other so that they could stay there together and they would communicate secretly in different ways, uh, leaving things like, you know, behind so the other could go find it and stuff like that. I'm gonna cry just thinking about that. Oh, I just can't even imagine my kids. You know, and for us, that was in the same era. My grandpa was alive when I was alive. And it's like just a constant reminder. All it takes is people who think they're good, thinking they're doing the right thing, a series of bad decisions to destroy the lives of so many people, you know, and, um, and the relationships, you know, like my grandpa and his siblings, such complicated relationships, families really struggled to heal. Um, 
And so I just, I just love this picture of my son. Cause you know, there he is with his baby. He loves carrying his sisters. <laughs> Even when he was tiny, the sister that's closest in age to him here, she's only a year and a half younger. He was always trying to pick her up and carry her around and protect her, you know, and it's, they've been allowed to have that relationship. And the words for older sibling, younger sibling, all that kind of stuff have been able to come back. Um, actually, there isn't really a word for older sibling. It's more like older female cousin, older male cousin, or relative, I should say, because like your cousins and your siblings are the same in our language, which you see with our children. You know, my nephew just, just raised two houses down from us and all of our kids, they're allowed to just come and go. You know what I mean? It's like... Um, they're raised more like siblings, I'd say, than on my non-native side, even siblings are, if that makes sense. And so, um, yeah, and then here's another picture of my son just a few years ago after he learned how to um, make salmon or prepare salmon for smoking and things like that. So we have our kids here now so we can teach them again. And all the words just come flooding back. You know, they're, they're so much easier to teach when we can actively teach them the context while we're doing it. Uh, this was supposed to actually go up a few slides back. So this is uh, me and my cousins at Chief Seattle Days in that first canoe, the Siama Oaks, the year that it uh, came out. And, you know, I'm wearing a wool regalia. This is one of the first wool regalias I've ever made with a cedar cape that I made she's wearing. And then this is my cousin, Cassie, who actually, when I stepped away from doing language work, she really stepped in, even going as far as getting her master's in linguistics and moving in with our teacher so that she could learn full immersion with him, like full time. Like, I mean, she took the, just those little seedlings we were planting and she, she grew a whole, uh, she grew a whole like self from it. I don't know how to, like, she can go on for hours in our language without one break, you know? This too is supposed to go back there. This was part of my girls group. Uh, North Kitsap High School was not a very good place for us when we were kids. Uh, we were not treated very well by a lot of the staff. Um, I was not subjected to a lot of the same discrimination because my mom is non-native. She's a white educated lady, works in education. So I was given better treatment and often um, would kind of serve as like a protective barrier for my cousins who were not treated so well and who were labeled. And it was just, it was not a very good experience for us. And so uh, one day when we were, when we had the Native American assembly, um, <coughs> we got up, <laughs> we'd gotten in trouble just a few weeks prior for walking out of a class. Uh, I, you know, I'd never, I was a very good kid. I was like a super duper band geek, like just, you know, a goody two shoes, teacher's pet type of kid. But there was a teacher, a non-native lady who meant well, but she was trying to teach Native American literature. And they signed us all up for this class without even asking us if we wanted to take it, just the assumption because we were all native that we would want to take it. And basically the class was just like listening to her identity issues and explaining why she wasn't a racist white lady <laughs> and reading some Sherman Alexi in between. Like that was basically the gist of the class. And we were tolerant because that's just a, you know, at least she, at least her form of violence wasn't cruel. You know what I mean? And she was trying to do the right thing. And like, you know, so we just would quietly endure. But um, one day she came in with some beads, blue glass trade beads. We knew what they were because it was part of our cultural paradigm and background. Um, we're even wearing them. You can't really see it so much on us here in this picture. Only she'd found those beads on Sandy Hook Road, like the, the or the, the beach that went from Sandy Hook to the George Lane Beach. And she was saying how she and her friends were walking down the beach and without even realizing she was admitting to trespassing for one. And two, um, without really realizing she was telling us she'd picked up our ancestors things, you know, and automatically assumed they were hers. 
and she was trespassing on specifically my cousin's property, a child in that class, like specifically his family property. And she was trespassing there, admittedly. She found artifacts and still felt like she was entitled to keep them. And we know what those artifacts were from. It's from the family graveyard that's eroding into the beach. So we know when we find things on that beach, we leave it. We don't touch it. Maybe sometimes the elders will come through, collect them, and rebury them. But, you know, we come across bones. We come across, you know, we come across all kinds of things. So not only had she stolen while trespassing on the reservation, she'd picked up artifacts from literally our ancestors who were buried right there and was showing them off to us as though we were supposed to just be an, I, I don't know what she was trying to communicate to us. But I mean, it just, we all just kind of like looked at each other and got up and left, you know, um, and got in a lot of trouble for it. And that was the first time I'd ever gotten inside school suspension. And so um, anyways, a few days later, we were here at the assembly and they were trying to decide whether or not we were allowed to do the assembly because of the walkout. And I talked, you know, I had a good relationship at the time with the vice principal. I was at the time helping them design Kingston High School. I got to name that road CIS. You know, I picked that specifically because it's a word that's universally understood to mean family and like extended network. And so I knew it would be a friendly greeting for any indigenous child that, you know, came into school. So, um, you know, she and I had a good working relationship at the time, and I was able to explain where we were coming from. And I was like, you know, it wasn't a conscious thing. It was just in, a mo in that moment, we didn't feel safe, and we had to remove ourselves. And we didn't, you know, we knew that she didn't understand what she was doing. So it's like, not like any of us were going to take it out on her. But we had to go collect ourselves, because, I mean, she still, I don't think, fully grasped, grasped it but she allowed us to dance still and carry on with our um, assembly. And so we did, you know, and here's my <laughs> same dress. This dr Everyone has worn this dress. Like <laughs> there was a time when we didn't have any, any woven wool regalia. And so I had made this wool dress, uh, again, just trying to reclaim things along with Peg. And for a lot of girls in my tribe, it was the first time they'd ever worn any ancestral like regalia. So you'll see all throughout like Suquamish photographs between like 2003 and like 2019, this dress just pops up on a bunch of random people. I mean, it's traveled the continent. It's gone all over the place. And it's because like for a lot of people, that was their first time being able to wear, um, you know, ancestral clothing. So my cousin Melissa is wearing it here and we're doing a uh, spinning water. It's a you know, special dance to us. And uh, we got to get up and talk about like why this was so important to us. And anyways, though, I just really love this picture because, um, you know, this, this girl here, she passed away fairly violently not too long ago. And uh, I really, we were all still suffering the impact of colonization and the um, the very violent ways that our people had been taught to not function inside of our own bodies as indigenous people. And I honestly feel like being able, this was the first time she ever danced publicly and wore regalia. And um, you know, she stayed up with me the whole night before, making sure we had enough for everybody and just throwing things together as fast as possible. And I honestly think it saved, it, it prolonged her life. I honestly think that because uh, she was already struggling with substance abuse, even at that age. And one of the things about um, her ancestral ways of life, a lot of people don't feel comfortable mixing, you know, the traditional stuff with substance abuse. So if they're going to participate in various things, they put it away, they, they, they abstain at least long enough to participate. And um, so for her language, weaving, dancing, it, you know, it, it, it kept her around a lot longer than I think um, if those things hadn't been there, she would have been able to. 
we tried really hard that year, so hard. Oh my gosh, did we try to get our language recognized as a foreign language credit in school. And of course, North Kitsap was like, mm, no. And the only two teachers that really, really, really advocated with me were Mr. Olson, who was my math teacher of all things. So he, he was just amazing though, I loved that guy. Like he would always set aside 20 minutes at the end of the day for my random questions about life. Like, <laughs> you know, not just math related, but just whatever else I wanted to know because he just seemed to know the answer to like everything. I finally stumped him on um, whether cherry tomatoes were more closely related to grapes or uh, I forget like what, I can't remember what it was. He's like, that you'll have to ask a biologist. <laughs> you know? um, and so, uh, or blueberries, that's what it was. Or cherry tomatoes more related to grapes or blueberries. And so... And uh, the other one was Miss Denton, Kari Denton. She was the uh, Japanese teacher at the time. They made me take Japanese because I, they wouldn't accept Lashutsi as a foreign language credit, even though I was teaching it, right? And so in protest, Kari would come to my language classes to learn Lashutsi. And um, one of my favorite lullabies I sing my, my children, she wrote actually in our language in support of um, my efforts. And uh, eventually she started working for our tribe. And so that at our school. So that was uh, when we built Chief Kitsap Academy. So that was really, and at our early learning center. So that was really cool, a really wonderful, like, you know, full circle effort. Um, I guess now, I don't know, I heard North Kitsap now recognizes the shoot seat as a foreign credit. I'm not sure if that's just through the PALS program or what, like, I don't know what the specifics are, but but uh, that was, that's something, if it's not in place, that could be where you guys can come in handy with, like, helping make happen. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I was younger, we didn't really see our language much written, you know, um, the flag that our tribe had had a misspelling of our, you know, you know, of our tribal name on it in our language. But that was about the only public appearance I saw. Now it's everywhere. I mean, you see it written everywhere, from clothing to signs. I mean, it's it's everywhere. Even if we don't have people speaking fluently, I would say most people in Suquamish know a few phrases at the very least. Um, here. This ceremony right here, this is my cousin Cassie's wedding, the one who went to Oregon to get, you know, get her master's in lingu uh, linguistics and, you know, learn full immersion from our teacher. Her entire wedding was in our language. The whole ceremony from the time we got up at dawn to do the, you know, because our ceremonies last not just, you know, a few minutes, they're wholly interactive. So that ceremony began at dawn when we go and we do what we call swimming. And all of it was in our language, the whole shebang. And um, even the prep for it here, you know, uh, getting all the food and everything together for it, the plants, the uh, salmon and things like that. We were able to do a lot of full immersion with our kids gearing up for this because that's, I mean, yes, yeah, she wanted to get married you know, and her husband's non-native, but he's fully dedicated to the um, bringing back of our language. So he's, you know, he he's agreed to speak Lashutzi with their daughter and with us. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to behold, actually. And uh, so all of the prep and everything, as much as we could, we fit in language. And a day of the whole ceremony was done in our language, which is the first sense before the boarding schools. Like I'd say probably it's been about 160 years since any of our events were ever done exclusively in our language. <coughs> so I'm at the last couple slides here and I wanted to include these ones of my daughter, my older daughter, I have three in total, but um, this one right here, this day, it just, I mean, this looks like just a normal picture. You know, she's wearing modern clothes and everything. But, you know, she's nine years old here and she was part of the options program at Wolfley at the time. And, you know, I was options alumni too. So that was like a great program. But she was late to school that day because we saw J-Pot. And this was um, 
they were, you know, they've always been struggling, but that year they were struggling a lot and we hadn't seen Jay pod in a while. And she said, mom, 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 call, call a H. She forgot the word for orca. And, you know, nine years old. And she, you know, she just, she's like, call, call H. She, she couldn't remember what they were called, you know, but that's our word. And so I knew exactly what she meant. So we, we turned around, we drove down to the dock and we got down and we ran down there. And, you know, her first association with Kalt Kalachich was to sing a whale song to them, you know, which is just so, I mean, for me, like, it made me cry so much because, like, that, that was her association. Some other guy on the beach got on his boat and, like, went to harass them. And that was his association, you know, with seeing J-Pod, if that, you know, like, it just really, for me, showed the difference in um, how, like, the culture we're surrounded by, the language we speak, the way it conditions the way we think, you know. My daughter's association was to celebrate them from a distance, and this other person's association was to go get up in their space and bother them. Um, <coughs> This is another picture of my daughter. Uh, the day, this was another time I finally got to use some language that I'd never used outside of like scholarly study. Um, it was the day she'd started menstruating for the first time. And in our ancestral spirituality, that's nothing to be ashamed of or afraid of. It's something to be celebrated. Like it's a big freaking deal, you know? And so, you know, we made her some new regalia and we, you know, I went outside to like, do a little photo shoot with her and uh, we started planning her ceremony around it. We had mask dancers come down from our Canadian lineage. We're also Cowichan First Nations to celebrate um, this transition for her, you know, from childhood to womanhood. You know, there's an in-between stage, you know, with us. A lot, some cultures they considered, you know, your, your menstruation as like, okay, now you're a woman. For us, it was just the beginning of that transition. You know, you went from Josh child to Kabite, which is teenager. The next is Fadite, which later comes on, but you know, so she, she went from in the baby stage to, or the child stage to, uh, you know, the teenage stage. And we had a huge ceremony around it. Um, involving multiple days and multiple steps and so that was the first time I actually got to live some of our language um, and it was the first time that ceremony has been done for a Suquamish girl in 200 years since the potlatch ban I'd gone to other cousins from other tribes that's you know how, how I learned the knowledge you know what I mean but uh, that was the first time that was done and because of that she was given two Indian names two ancestral names to protect her with and, you know, one of them, Guagualitsa, means you protect, to protect by making a strong mark. It, she's a very strong-willed child. Like, <laughs> the elders picked her name well. And she inherited that name from a Skagit <coughs> ancestor. But they picked that one for her. Um, and the other one is to heal with, you know, physical medicine. But uh, I just really, you know... It, these things that were robbed of my dad's generation, not necessarily through policy and whatnot, which, you know, that was a big part of it, but just through not being able to practice it because it was literally illegal. Like in my older sister's lifetime, this would have gotten us arrested. This would have gotten my children taken away. So, um, that, I mean, that's just something that people need to be cognizant of. This is something that literally got my great grandma's uncles and aunts hung. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of healing that still needs to happen. If that makes sense. So here is the 2009 canoe journey hosting. I included this because yeah, you, know, you saw back in the slides before after they burned old man house or long house, how people set up tents underneath. Well, this is a little bit further down the beach from where Old Man House was, but we designed it to be, you know, similar in nature and serve a similar purpose. And so we were able to bring back that communal space. And I'd say everything from, gosh, I can't, I can't even count all the events that we've held in this space. And, um, 
even here, you know, now we have so many more canoes. This was the most canoes I'd seen ever up until this point in 2009. Now I'd say this whole beach would be just filled with them. And every canoe will have people speaking our language in it. Whereas before it was literally just me in the front of one of the canoes speaking broken Lachute seed. And then us Willie or Vi, our elders. And now it's so commonplace. I doubt anyone will ever remember who that one, you know, it's like you know, that one little girl getting up and, you know, brokenly introducing themselves. And it's not just introducing, it's the call and response now too. Whole conversations can happen in it. <clears throat> and that's, you know, like I said, just one lifetime. So here we are again with Cassie's wedding. As stated, the whole thing was done in our language, right down to uh, the singing in of the canoes. This was the first time in centuries that a bride was brought in like this, being danced in onto, I mean, I, I came in on a canoe. A lot of us came in on one canoe. Some came in on two, but never danced in traditionally like this with full regalia, full songs. We were able to bring back so much just with one ceremony. And so I, I just really love this picture because you saw a little bit of it way back in uh, this slide here. Same beach, similar setup, zero children, no women, you know, um, versus now, you know, canoe full of children and our elders and our singers and our dancers and out in the public. And I have a picture of my baby here, <coughs> my little Lucy. And I, um, the reason I included this picture is because quite literally from birth, she's just a few days old here. She is surrounded by what we call squadzada. You know, she's got her, her, I set it up so she looked like a little grandma, you know, little grandma out gathering. Um, you know, she's got her woven blanket here. She's got her miniature drum that my grandpa gave my oldest son when he was a baby there. She's got her little basket of uh, berries and plant medicines. She's got her necklace with the trade beads and the dentalium, you know. She's got her ribbon skirt. She's got her moccasins. It's like she's just, and she's, we've got cedar there. <laughs> and she is just literally surrounded by all the things that were literally illegal for us to teach our children up until my older sister's lifetime. And, um, you know, one of the things that Cassie and I both, you know, what I wanted when I was younger was to only ever do full immersion with my children and, you know, life or my life path just, you know, that, that wasn't able to happen. But what I was able to give them was each of them when they were born, the very first words I spoke to them were in our language. The first things they heard were our language. And the first songs I ever spoke to them were in our language. And the first foods I ever fed them aside from breast milk were foods from our land. And, you know, they got to, and that's, I know that to non-natives that might not sound like much, but for us, that is just, that, that was huge. Um, my cousin Cassie, the one who's the bride here, she's doing full immersion with her baby. She's been able to do that. Her daughter's about a year now and uh, has heard the shoot seed spoken regularly every day since she was born. She's the first child in over a hundred years for that to be the case. And uh, so now she and I are working together. We are, we've given up on trying to do it through the tribal avenue though that, I mean, that has been, um, I mean, it has helped, but it's gone, it's taken so long. It's been 20, let's see, about 22 years that I've been that she and I both have been engaged in these efforts, but when we have to go through the tribal government, it just it just takes too long to get the things that we want done done. So now we're both just staying home with our babies and doing full immersion as much as we can through language nests. So that's where we're at. I'm sorry that went over. Do you have any questions? Oh no. I think all of us are probably stunned. What an incredible presentation. I can't even begin to thank you. You 
your life has really changed the life of so many people. And that doesn't, not everybody gets to have that experience to be a transformer. Um, and you've really lived that and how beautiful. Ah, thank you. I can, thank you. It just seems so little. I was around a lot of transformers. <laughs> I've just been the, the connector, if that makes sense. It does make sense, but that's a blessing too, isn't it? That to be allowed, you know, in the position of a great, uh, it's a great blessing to be a transformer in the, in a lineage of transformers and to be in a position to pass that on. But it sounds like you really persevered and spent so much time investigating and following leads and listening, especially. Um, I'd say that's my autistic superpower. <laughs> <laughs> really get that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, what's what enabled it though? A lot of it was literally white white passing privilege, because I was allowed to leave school for things because I know how to communicate things in English to administrators in ways that they would be accepting and supportive. Having a mom who worked in education, and so these were her colleagues, you know. Um, the privilege of even just being a fast learner because I could make up whatever I missed in class later on and still do really well on tests and whatnot, which isn't the case for all children, let alone Indigenous kids um, raised with multiple layers of non-privilege. Time. Um, when I was in elementary school, the second half of my elementary school experience, I got to go to the options program, which at the time didn't have the junior high or high school levels. You know, we were just, we were kind of the first batch of experimental babies. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the options program, but, um, you know, and even though my teachers committed a lot of racial, like, you know, uh, fumbles, you know, I have some funny stories about that. They were so supportive of what I was trying to do, even when I was little, that my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Bolgers, let me host a whole potlatch instead of teaching the super racist Westford expansion unit that he had, where we were sitting in circles and, you know, like wearing paper vests and like giving ourselves stereotypical names. I was like, I'm not doing this. And he was like, at first he was like, well, why? And I'm like, cause this isn't native. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so after a meeting with my parents, he was like, okay, well, no, well, you're going to teach me. Like, what would you, how would you guys go about a naming ceremony? And so we, I got to stage a whole potlatch with my class. I don't know how many of you know, um, oh, what's Emily's new last name? I always forget her last name. because I always think of her as Emily Oakley or Howlett. She's kind of... Uh, Emily Schultz, or oh gosh, there's a number of people that are kind of well known in the Kitsap area who are part of that class. And so for them, like on the non native side, they didn't get to just like learn accurate history and like social studies and whatever. They got to actually participate, you know, and it cultivated this strong allyship. And these are the same people, you know, 30 or, you know, almost 30 years later that I lean into as allies when I need stuff to get done. And so it's like, it, it, it benefited all of us for my teacher to have that freedom to say, okay, for the next you know month, for this, for this many hours a day, we're gonna block it off to preparing for a potlatch in a ceremony. And so we like, you know, um, we were able to do weaving, we were able to do like, carving even. I don't think they'd allow kids knives at school anymore. <laughs> we were allowed to do like <clears throat> all kinds of things to create the gifts that we were giving away. I got to do some little Lachute seed, like, you know, or Indian at the time. I didn't quite call it Lachute seed yet. Teaching my classmates some Indian, how to speak it, you know, the etiquette. We had my, my aunt come in, like we just got to do all kinds of cool things. I got to take them out to gather, you know, whatever was seasonal at the time. And um, I don't think that would be the case anymore. I don't even know even with options anymore. And so it's like, these are just some things. If, we're, if people are serious about helping indigenous people bring back language, we have to allow our children the time and the space to do so. And I, that's a struggle even with my kids. 
you know, like I struggle with it, even with them here. Like right now we've missed a couple gathering seasons because I can't take them out of school to go harvest things. So it's like, and, and even if I do, they don't bounce back as quickly as I did when it comes to um, their studies, you know, it takes them a little bit longer than it would have me. And so it's like, there's still a break in the transference of knowledge just because we are forced to cooperate within these Western systems. So I, for me, I think the solution is to incorporate them. Like, you know, I think every child in our region, native or non, should be learning how to interact with the land. Yes. Should have La Chute seed as part of that. It should be integrated into everything. I mean, I don't know. That's just my, I don't, I don't see why not. Like when I go to other countries, the indigenous language is dominant everywhere. I don't see why it can't, if not dominant, why not incorporated into everything? So, wow. No, I feel like we've made you talk for a really long time, <laughs> but I could listen to you a lot longer, but I don't want to, I know you have other calls on your time as well. And I so appreciate that after a very traumatic morning, you yeah. came and presented this truly outstanding program. Thank you so much. It's um, just another Tuesday for us. This is, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, not Tuesday, it's like Monday, but you have know, the saying, we're used to racism. I know. It's, it's the North gets up high school. It's the same story from when I was 16. So it's just, it's just routine. There's a lot of racism in the schools in Bainbridge too. And we don't like to remember that or admit it, but it's true. Um, mm -hmm. And I am reminded by what you're doing that all of us can use our white privilege if we have it to, uh, to help forward better, better programs and better understanding. So again, thank you so much for the generosity 